For example, parents had to watch their babies being burnt in ovens. They tied parents up while they massacred their children and the other way round. They shot parents in front of the kids to mm. make the kids scream, which caused mm. neighbours to come running to help mm. the children. And mm. when their neighbours came running to help, Hamas would just shoot. Hi everyone, in a previous episode we started talking about our journey regarding Israel and October 7th and everything that's happened since and in that episode we talked more about kind of our response, the reactions that we had after the the terrorist attack and how we then started to plan our way forward. In this episode we're going to talk more about what we actually did in Israel. We've been three times since October 7th so there's a lot of things for us to go over, stories to share the impact on us, on other people that we engage with or people that came with us on the trip. Um, But before we go into that, there's a lot of people that watch the YouTube videos, but they aren't actually subscribed to the channel. It doesn't cost you anything, but if you would please hit that subscribe button, it would really help us and the channel and its growth and the reach that the videos have in terms of the people that view it and helping to get the stories out there of people that are living these radical lifestyles that we hope will encourage and challenge more people to live lives that will impact not just themselves, their families, but also the communities and the world that that we all live in. So if you'd consider doing that, that'd be fantastic. Don't consider it, just do it. In fact, maybe we should just sit here and wait until they hit that subscribe button. I think not. Okay, fine, we'll carry on. (laughs) Okay, so we ended up in the previous episode, while in Israel, we kind of arrived and talked a bit about that. So during the trips we we called them solidarity and serve trips and in this episode we'll talk more about sort of the solidarity side of it not so much to serve we'll we'll talk more about that in another episode mm-hmm. and um we we put together this this plan this itinerary which could change at any moment because obviously wars don't work around your schedule they kind of do what they do and you have to figure things out as you go along so sometimes we would wake up one day <clears throat> Something would have happened and we have to figure out what we're going to do that day. So there was a bit of that. We managed to keep that away from the people. So the people that were there with us had no idea what was going on. I'm just behind the scenes trying to figure things out as we go along. We started the trip um, on the Gaza Strip and visiting kibbutzes that were uh, a part of the massacres where Hamas came in got into those communities and kidnapped people, killed people. So maybe we can start at one of those kibbutzes. We, we've been to a couple of them. Whether you think about the kibbutz Kavaza near Oz, when we got there, what were your initial thoughts or even in the process of, of going to those kibbutzes? Well, I think, we wanted to go there because we didn't want to start serving the people with just the detached idea of what had happened to them. We didn't feel that was genuine or authentic. So we knew it was going to cost us emotionally, yeah. but I don't think we realized just how much it was going to. And we don't regret any of that. So I think for all of us, when we were going, we had no idea, no real idea of what we were going to see Um how it was going to impact us. But I think the first thing that impacted me was how close Gaza is and how close it was to Kfar Hazar. Um, it was easy to walk across. It was about a mile away. You could, yeah, within you could a couple see of miles. It. Yeah, you could see it. You, the, the border fence almost merged into nothing as you looked across. Um, and... I think the next thing that impacted me was people from Gaza were coming and going to the kibbutz on a daily, regular basis because the people there employed them. So you're talking about before October 7th. Yes. Yeah. So people there employed them. They were in their homes. They were um, helping in all manner of ways. So they knew the people personally. They were a key part of building those communities. Yeah. And the people from Gaza knew the layout of the homes. They knew the layout of all the kibbutz. They know the children. They knew how many children there were in in each home. They knew where the emergency responses were. Yes, they knew it all. 
And they knew it because of the kindness of the Israeli people in wanting to employ them and to help them. So I think those two things are what, first of all, hit me. We weren't just talking about an army because Gaza hasn't got an army. We were talking about people who are acquainted with each other. So when they came and they start entering the homes, kidnapping babies, etc., and they may very well have been people they actually saw as friends prior to this. Or at least the Israelis thought. Yeah, they a, thought they were. At least on some kind of friendly mm. basis. <clears throat> so uh, in Kafaza we had, uh, and, and near Oz, we had people that lived in those communities mm-hmm. take us, show us what had happened, tell us stories, and uh, both were similar in some ways, but also quite different. Um, I, I know you're know, going into some of the homes and mm. seeing the destruction. You could see the blood stains on the wall, on the floor, the bullet holes everywhere. Um, you, yeah, I sort of think one of the things that really impacted me was seeing a baby's shoe lying on the floor, and it brought home the intimacy of the moment. Um, I can't imagine what it would have been like showing people around my home having been through that in it and having it destroyed because usually you want everything nice for people coming. This was horrendous. Yeah, and they're showing you around while still going through all the trauma of mm. everything they'd lived through. Um, I, I know that the person that showed us around Kavazar, uh, we went back a second time and asked if he would be able to do it again. And he just said, I can't, I can't keep mm. going over this story is completely understandable and um that's why how we ended up then going on to near oz uh, but you could go into buildings and just you could smell the death um mm. as you went through uh, some of them were completely burnt out um the home we went into in in near oz with the person that was showing us around her home was completely burnt out um her family hid in the bomb shelter and uh, there was a massive explosion and Hamas tried to basically burn them out of their bomb shelter. And uh, they they managed to survive um, by cracking the bomb shelter window open slightly, which is bulletproof, and uh, just sucking air through a small gap, taking turns to do it. Fortunately, Hamas didn't hear the window crack open, and uh, all of them survived. But you go around these homes and you hear these different stories and it makes it a much more personal situation. Maybe we didn't know these people, but by us going and entering entering into their homes, entering into their stories, it brought it all home to us much, much more. Her son um, said to her at one stage, just open the door and let them kill us, mum. Yeah, because the bomb shelter was filling up with smoke and realised they were going to run out of air very quickly. And he was a small boy. Yeah. And the person who showed us round in Kanvar Hazar, um, they hid in their bomb shelter room. And I don't know what I thought a bomb shelter was before, but it wasn't like it. what I thought of it. It was like another room in the house, but the door was reinforced and you just pull the handle over into like a socket. You didn't lock it because nobody expected to have to lock it. It's for bombs. Um well, he, um, him and his wife had to hold the bomb shelter yeah. door, uh, the handle up for 36 hours until someone came to help them. And Hamas made his home in Kavazar their base camp. And so they slept in his home. They shot people from his home. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, so him and his wife had to hold that handle up 36 hours until someone came to, to help they, them. We're using words like massacre, etc., but they don't convey the horror, the horror. Um for example, parents had to watch their babies being burnt in ovens. They tied parents up while they massacred their children and the other way around. They shot parents in front of the kids to mm. make the kids scream, which caused mm. neighbours to come running to help mm. the children. And mm. when their neighbours came running to help, Hamas would just shoot them as they were running to the house. Mm. Um, so, yes, yeah, so these are some of the things that we saw in the kibbutz. And all the bullet holes everywhere. The bullet holes everywhere. There was one home we went into. And um, the bullet holes are sprayed all around the outside and inside, I guess, which would have been their sitting room, just bullet holes sprayed all over the room. And um, in that house, there was a boyfriend and girlfriend that lived there. 
and Hamas threw a grenade at the house. The boyfriend threw himself on top of the grenade uh, to save his girlfriend, but Hamas went in after they'd blown him up and raped her and killed her anyway. Um, when the IDF came and got one family out, they told them, we're going to lead you out, but make sure you and your children keep your eyes to the ground because they didn't want them to see the destruction, the blood, the mutilated bodies everywhere. Of their friends. Yeah, of their friends and their neighbours. They were wanting to, you know, to, they were already going to be traumatised, but let's try and reduce this a little bit. So when they did bring the family out, uh, everyone kept their eyes down, but the wife looked up to see what had happened and just saw friends bodies all over the ground blood everywhere um i think even while we're talking i'm thinking our words are very inadequate you know yeah. how, how can we convey to you who are listening the utter utter horror of it um but when we left there we went on to the scene of the music festival didn't we yeah so uh, we went for the from the kibbutz themes over to the site of the music festival and um Again, we, you you get there and you look around and it's just masses of open space. Mm. And so when Hamas got there, there was nowhere for people to run and hide. Not mm. very good hiding places anyway. A lot of it was people would run into fields of vegetation and just duck into into the, the vegetation and hope they weren't found. Um, one of the people that came to share with our group was a survivor from the Nova Music Festival. She mm. was one of the ones that managed to get away. And her story is just unbelievable. Uh, I'm sure as many of the other survivors, their stories will be equally as unbelievable as well. But you you get there, and now they've got these stakes in the ground with the pictures of the people that were either killed or taken hostage. Uh, one of those people was a friend of my niece. They were learning Hebrew together, and he was taken by Hamas and was killed. And... So we, you know, we took some pictures of those and sent them back to my niece. And um, yeah, again, you see these people going, seeing the pictures of their loved ones, their friends, just weeping. And um, again, it, not far from from Gaza. Uh, in fact, uh, Hamas didn't know about it. They found it with drones. And uh, the people at the music festival, some of them thought, wow, look at this production. They're filming it with drones and all this kind of stuff. And they didn't realize that this was a, a drone from Hamas. And Hamas then attacked the music festival. And whether you say this is good or bad, you know, Hamas's hope was actually to make it to Jerusalem. And it, it seems by them attacking the music festival site, it, it delayed them being able to do that. So they didn't get as far into Jerusalem, um, which is kind of weird for, for our friend who survived that to be talking about it as if, you know, well, I guess them attacking where I was prevented other people across Israel getting hit by Hamas. Yeah, and uh, we have to realize this was planned in great detail. This wasn't just a bunch of people wandered across. This was planned. And the evidence of a lot of this came from the, um, what do you call it? When they found, when they got to the bodies of the Hamas terrorists yeah. that they killed, they had maps on them, yeah. um, which laid out the kibbutzes, where all the homes were and all that kind of stuff, where they were supposed to go and target. And they filmed it, and they filmed it themselves. And not only that, they would take phones off the dead body or off the person they had captured, and then they would video it and send it to family members and that on the phone so they would see it actually happening i know some of them live streamed it on the yeah. on the uh, social media of the people they were killing it, it it is unbelievable even having been there and we're saying it i'm thinking this is evil beyond absolutely anything and, and connected into the kibbutzes and the music festival site we, we went to magan david Adon, which is the ambulance service in israel mm. and heard about this attack from their perspective which some of it was as, as daphne was just saying was planned out in great detail like on the maps that they found where ambulances were marked on there go and destroy the ambulance so that as the attack happens there's no immediate first responders because they've destroyed the ambulance mm. they've taken over the armories the security within each kibbutz 
And uh, so then when the emergency responders, the paramedics or security go running to their stations, Hamas are already there and take them out. So, um, yeah, we hear about it from Magan David Adom's perspective. Uh, hear audio, see video footage that their ambulances picked up. They have some ambulances which are bulletproof, but most of them are not. So a lot of these paramedics had to decide to drive into the attack, mm. even though the ambulance wasn't bulletproof. And uh, many gave their lives to to try and help in, in this horrendous situation. Um, the bulletproof ones, they ended up setting like, like a, a relay. So in some places, the bulletproof vans, were, the ambulances would go in, pick up people, they would drive out, switch the body, the people over into non-bulletproof ambulances, they would go and the bulletproof ones would go back in again to get people. Um, it amazed me how organized they were in a situation that was totally chaos and they had no idea it was happening, they hadn't prepared for anything like this. But um, as Israelis do, they got themselves organized and they their hero, they, the heroic deeds they did um, will never be told this this side of eternity, but it was you just sit there and you look at these these men telling these stories and go out and see the ambulances and it all becomes very very real. The the people and the um, the ambulances that should have spelt safety to um, those who were suffering. They just couldn't get to them. And they couldn't even tell the IDF because some of those from Gaza dressed in IDF uniforms. So they would see them come in and think, great, the IDF is coming to rescue us. But they weren't. They were actually coming to mutilate, rape, and um, destroy them. Yeah, so um, we hear about it from Megan David Adam's perspective. And by the way, uh, some of these people we've done – episodes with on the podcast the mm. last several episodes we've released we've had a survivor from nova we've had spokesperson and pers- someone who actually drove in to help speaking about what happened with them we've had some of these other people that we're going to talk about coming up as well so go back over the last several episodes and check those out um, as well as hearing the last episode we we talked about um, as we were leaving actually the nova music festival site we we drove past an area where there was a field and there were all these cars stacked up on top of each other and we pulled over to go and have a look at at what was there and they were all cars that were destroyed by Hamas I I can't even describe how many but you had these cars burnt out stacked you know 10 10 cars high spanning whole widths of fields and then they had other cars in there as well which were destroyed but not necessarily burnt out and um, actually, as we were driving around, you could see on the road these massive burnt patches. And that's where they found a lot of these cars that were destroyed. They, they burnt with such great intensity, they, they scarred the tarmac. And so as you're driving, you could see these spots and, and imagine where there was a car here. They burnt two bodies in this car here. And so we stopped there, had a look at that site for a bit. Um, and then we, we kind of headed up into jerusalem and uh, one of the areas that we saw while in jerusalem slash tel aviv was a place called hostage square do you want to talk a bit about what hostage square is yes it's been set up as called a memorial to those taken hostage but also as a reminder that there are people still still as we record this um being held captive still 101 as of right now yeah and um, one of the most moving things, I think, was a table that is set out for a Shabbat meal. When we went the first time, it was all white, pristine, all set up with with all the chairs, but also with the baby places for babies to sit. And it was like we're we're waiting for you to come and take your place at the Shabbat table because the attack happened on Shabbat. Yeah. So when we went back the third time, not. It did not look like that. It looked like grey. It was all distressed. It was all distressed and really symbolised the feelings of the Israeli people. Of course, some hostages have been released. But as some Andrew killed. just said. There were just okay. bodies that were recovered. Yeah. Um, 101 un- unaccounted for. Um, they had a, uh, a mock tunnel there. Yeah. Did you go through that? Yeah. 
What was that like? Um, to be quite honest, it was bad because you could hear what would be gunfire, etc. did sound effects. But I knew what the tunnels actually were like were a thousand times worse than that. Um, so big, you could drive 18-wheeler trucks through. Yeah, some of the tunnels are massive. So, and and the, think about the IDF. They don't have the equipment they need for this war because it's all going into defence. So you can imagine them going into these booby trap tunnels. They can't do anything like flooding them because they don't know if there's hostages in them. So they're having to go into these dark, enormous tunnels. I mean, some of them are miles and miles long, aren't they? The whole tunnel system is larger than the London underground system. Yeah. So it's massive. I think between three and 400 miles of tunnels. And, of course, these were built with uh, materials that were sent to Gaza as aid for them to build schools, mm. uh, hospitals, all that kind of stuff. And instead of building something to help Gaza, the communities there, they decided actually we're going to build something to help us for terror to attack our neighbours. Um, and we, we've, again, we've had some guests on, uh, one in particular, him and his team have been pioneers when it came to going in and dealing with the tunnel systems. So you can go and hear him talking much more extensively about what that was like uh, and the experience doing that. Uh, as well as John Spencer, we had him on as well, who's an urban warfare and subterranean warfare expert. So again, go check out those those episodes. So when we were at Hostage Square, there were people there um, with pictures of the hostages, and many of them actually had relatives or friends who were still hostages. And I was talking to a couple and hearing their story, and then... I said to the wife something that I said many times, and when I said it to the people at the two um, kibbutz, I said it all over the place. And I said to her, you know, we've come to tell you you're not alone. And she just looked at me and said, thank you. And then as I saw tears in her eyes, I said to her, would you like a hug? And she said, I'd love a hug. So I gave her a a hug and she said that's what I came for to have hugs so I said well would you like some more hugs and she said yes so I went round and found many of the women who had come with us and I said can you go over there and give her a hug so they went one after the other after the other and gave her a hug and then um, I thought well her husband's standing there maybe he'd like a hug <laughs> so I sent one of the men to say to him would you like a hug and he said I've been waiting for my hug. So then <laughs> I rounded up the men to go and give him a hug. But, you know, it's moments like that mm. is at the heart of why we went. We we went to be present with them in their suffering and going to the kibbutz, going going to Magdon, Magdon David Adam, Adam. and going to the hostage and, and all through it, Hostage Square and other places, it gave us the chance to be present with them in their suffering and to show them that we are prepared to emotionally just dip into it. We can't really understand their suffering. So I think if you were going to say to me what was the moment I remember most about Hostage Square, it was that couple and their heart cry just to have a hug in their desperate, desperate trauma um, through their tears, through their suffering, and through their anguish. Yeah, and connecting with the people the whole time was was really the key part behind it. And that mm. going to them and saying that we came all the way from England, America, Australia, Canada, wherever it is that people came from on our teams, to say, look, I came all the way from these places just to let you know you're not alone. That was kind of like the thread that went through the whole trip, was engaging with those local people um, who have gone through so much. And, you, and that's literally all you have to say. Just say that and stop and then just wait and hear the responses and the stories and the tears that, that are shed and being able to engage in in that with them. Well, we've been going out there now, as we said on the last episode, 14 plus years. Never could we have done that before. I mean, thankfully in a way, because we wouldn't want to be in a situation like this, but their hearts are so hurting, so open, so wounded that 
when they know why we've come, they're just so grateful. I mean, if, if I said to most people, you know, I've come all the way from England to America to tell you I'm not alone, you'd probably look at this crazy. But these people, their hearts just crumbled. And, uh, well, it... Um, when you give them a hug, I think that's another way that you enter into their suffering because you, you connect with their pain. Right, because everyone in Israel, Jewish people all over the world feel completely abandoned. Mm. And uh, we, we talked a bit about that in the previous episode, and we'll talk more about it in the next one. Mm. But because there's this feeling of abandonment by the global body, um, that just saying those few words are, are deeply impactful, but not just saying those words – but because we went out there, we spent the money, we took the time to go out there, we took the risk or what people perceive as a massive risk of flying out to Israel during a war to look them in the eyes and say this. And so it, it hits differently from when you're just sending it on a message or posting something on social media, when you actually go and look people in the eyes. It's a, it's a whole other ball game. Well, a hug emoji doesn't do the same as arms around someone. Yeah, what's that little cute? Hmm. You make it. Um, yeah. But, but send them, tell them. Still do it. It needs to be done. There's, there's this, uh, there's a war in the media as well around this. And so mm. it's important that we continue to speak up and say things on social media. Still do that. But uh, I'll, I'll put a link in the description box. You know, we're, we're taking more trips next year, the next one in Jan- January. So if you're interested, go, uh, a link will be there and you can. Um, you can get involved as well by coming with us and actually looking people in the eyes. I think another thing about going is that when you said about impact, when you leave, you have a responsibility. Well, I feel we've got a responsibility to tell what we heard and and to say that we bore witness to something and we have to to tell as many people as we can what we saw before the media as it's starting to kicks fully into saying it didn't happen oh yeah i mean there's a lot of people out there that are denying all kinds they're either denying things happened or they're justifying Mm. these things happening yeah it's crazy Mm. um so during the trip as well we we heard from different experts um one of them uh, we've known for a long time he speaks to our groups almost every year is a guy called colonel danny terzo and he was a chief architect of the security barrier and so we had him come talk about the security barrier stuff that's been going on. Um, but one of his former positions was the head of strategic planning for the IDF command center. And that's been where he's been called back to now. So he came to share about the strategic side of the conflict. Um, someone called Charlotte Korshak from Stand With Us and uh, Yotam Dagan, who is he's like a, a former Israeli Navy SEAL commander and now is a trauma therapist expert. And so we had them come and share from different perspectives different angles of this conflict whether it's the strategic side or charlotte talking about the the global rise of Mm anti-semitism and jewish people being attacked in streets from from london to new york to paris Mm -hmm. and yotam from the trauma side of this and what it will mean for the nation but as individuals for people to work their way through these things um one of the you want to say something well no i was just going to say but i'm talking about the logistics was impacting, but we known all of them before October the 7th, and we saw them after October the 7th. Yeah. And that was shocking, really, to see each of them. We hardly had to say anything to them, but we could see the effect that, or some of the effect that it had, had on them. And something Charlotte said to the whole group has stayed with me. And she said, we are traumatized. We just feel we can't take anymore, but we have to, and it keeps coming. She said, we need you to stand in front of us and take some of the hits. And if you're on YouTube, you can probably see that I'm wearing a Star of David and something to, um, you got yours on, yeah, yeah. something to remember the hostages. And I've got had a Star of David for years, and I put it on strategically. If I want to be in a situation, I want somebody to say to me, why are you wearing Star of David? I'll put it on, but I don't wear it as a lifestyle. Now I wear it as a lifestyle. Um, Some Jewish youngsters 
ask me, why do you wear a Star of David expecting me to wear a cross? And I said, because so many Jewish people are afraid to wear anything that shows that they're Jewish. So I think to myself in my simplistic way, okay, don't you wear it, I'll wear it, and let them take me on. And those of you who know me will know that isn't an easy thing. But the <laughs> other thing is, if I don't wear it, how do Jewish people know that I'm connected with them, that I'm prepared to stand with them? Maybe I'm even Jewish, but they will know that I'm on team. So now this is on me until until whenever, um, again, strategically, but it's there for anybody and everybody to see. One of the speakers and groups we went to go and hear from is a group called Alma Research. And uh, I thought I'd tell you this story about getting there. Mm. It just gives you a bit of a, a behind the scenes look at what can happen on one of these trips. Yeah. Now, bear in mind, we want people to come on these next trips. So um, yeah, this wasn't as scary as it sounds, but no. well, we've um, been three times. We've been three times that so we're still here. And two wars, two conflicts we've been in. Yeah. And everybody said on the trip that they weren't afraid. So that's that yeah, backdrop so, to the story. Um, we got up that morning. We, we were in Jerusalem. We were heading um, north. And we were moving to another hotel. So we get on the bus and I do a security briefing. You know, what do we do in certain situations? If we hear a, a siren go off, which means a rocket's heading in our direction, what do we do while we're on the bus? Talking about all that kind of stuff. And uh, But I start the briefing by saying, now it's highly unlikely that we're going to hear a siren. But if we do, this is how we respond. Anyway, so we start driving. And about an hour later, we have this app on our phone. Um, kind of the more well-known one is Red Alert. And it tells you when a rockets have been fired at Israel. So about an hour later, my phone starts lighting up. So I'm going, what's going on? So I, I pull up the map. and the whole area that we were going to be driving up to get to the north was being bombarded by rockets. So we were like, okay, everyone that came on this trip knew there was a risk. They knew that there was a possibility that a rocket could get fired to our location. That's one risk level. And everyone said, fine. This was slightly different. The difference is now the rockets are hitting the areas where we are now deciding to drive into. So we decided let's just get an early lunch. We'll get together with a couple of the other leaders that had brought people with them, including uh, each one of them had brought a teenage daughter with them. And we uh, said, hey, we're going to have a quick lunch. Could you just sit with us away from the group uh, so we can just catch you up on a few things? So we have lunch. We tell them what's going on. We said, look, we need you to to think about this. We need you to pray and see what you think we should do going forward. Now, we didn't say anything because for us, we'll just keep going. Um, if we didn't have a group, if it's just us as a family, nothing's really going to stop us. So we needed them to to let us know what they were thinking we should do. Anyway, both said we should keep going. Like we came with a reason. We're going north to encourage the people there that are living under this constant rocket fire from uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon. So we keep going. We get to our destination. And I say to uh, a guide who's with us, I said, look, if tomorrow is as hot as it is today in terms of the rocket attacks, we can't go to Alma Research. We can't go to hear from them because they are right on the border of Lebanon. And we have to drive again through this whole zone which was being attacked. Now, fortunately, the next day it was quite quiet. So we still went, we had the briefing with them, and then we drove back to the hotel we were staying in in the north. About an hour later, the red alert starts going off. And so um, I then look at the map, where are the rockets going? And they were going straight to the area that we just had the briefing in. So we missed it going up. We traveled across, we had the briefing left, then the rockets attacked, so we missed that one. And actually, I then talked to the person that I was working with in terms of the planning, the logistics on the ground, 
and we're talking about a plan for the next day. And we, we thought, you know, let's not do this certain location. Let's go to another one. Mm. So we switch the location. And then that day we go to the new location. And while we're driving, the place we were meant to go to had a ground infiltration. And so we missed that as well. And so over those few days, it was like, we were just sort of maneuvering around and God was moving <laughs> us around to help us avoid what was going to be going on. Um, but it, I mean, that's just an example of a few days and some of the things that you kind of have to deal with more so behind the scenes. Again, people on the trip didn't know what we were figuring out and how we were doing things behind the scenes. They were just going along for the ride and um, doing what they had come to do, which yeah. is to engage, to see, to comfort and all that kind of stuff although you you did after you'd spoken to the leaders you did go and tell the whole bus didn't you oh yes i yes yeah, so i then got back on the bus after mm. we, we didn't talked just to them. drive them no, in without telling no. them <laughs> and i said to everyone so i started the morning by saying to you it was highly unlikely we were going to hear mm. a siren uh now i need to do a second briefing and let you know it's now highly likely we are going to hear a siren go off and i uh, had to give them a whole new uh security briefing but uh, one of the people on the bus was a 16 year old daughter of one of these other leaders. And she said, you know, if you had all decided not to go, I would have got off this bus and I would have walked there myself. So she was one that said that, but really was representative of how the whole group felt. They were here for a goal. They were here for a reason and they were going to do that and nothing was going to stop them. Oh. And so we were really blessed with a, a fantastic group of people that had, had gone uh, on this journey with us. Mm. And again, to be a blessing and, and an encouragement to the people there. And as we said earlier, really the thread of this whole trip, when we were going to these different locations and engaging with these different people, was just to look them in the eyes and say, we came all the way here to let you know that you are not alone and stop and then let them respond and share their stories, shed tears to hug them. And we're going to continue to do that. We have at least three more trips planned next year already. The first one in January, we've got another one in July. And again, we'll put the link in the description box. And if it's something that you're interested in doing, go and check out the details. Um, and if you've got questions, um, put them down below because um, we're open, we, yeah, we'll be doing another one about where we went to serve and what happened there. So we can answer your questions. So put them or put your comments below. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, thank you for coming on this journey with us. We hope that this has been more than just words and you have caught some of the heart behind it. Most of all, we hope that you have been able to capture just a tiny bit of the suffering of the people since during and since October the 7th. Yeah, so again, if you haven't subscribed, you've got this far, please hit subscribe mm. and uh, help us to spread the word of what's going on and, and the stories that we share. And let's get more people coming on this journey with us as we discover more about what it's like for people living all kinds of different lives, going through all kinds of different situations. Thanks again, everyone, and we will see you on the next episode. Thank you for listening to this episode. Remember, if it inspired you, share it with others so we can see more people engaged in this community.